and welcome back to another video and today I'm back with another true crime Tuesday video we've got a English serial killer for today's video but before we get into that I just want to do the usual so if you're new here my name's Amber I upload beauty fashion and lifestyle content and on a Tuesday I like to mix true crime and makeup together and I'm gonna sit and do my makeup while discussing a true crime case I always like to mention that I wasn't the first person to come up with this there is an amazing American youtuber called Bailey Sarian who does these um, murder mystery makeup up Mondays and it was her idea so I just drew inspiration from her videos and I've put my own little spin on it. I also just want to quickly say if you are new here then please hit that subscribe button and come along and join my little family and if you're already part of the family then make sure the notification bell is switched on just so you're notified of whenever I upload a video. I just want to say that um, in all of these videos I do say that viewer discretion is advised. I do not mean any disrespect to anyone mentioned in this video this is purely just things that I found on the internet that I've compiled together to put in to a educational video for you guys. So today's case is about the English serial killer John George Haig. Now John George Haig is also known as the acid bath murderer because of the way that he disposed of his victims. He was born on the 24th of July in 1909 in Stanford, Lincolnshire. His parents were John Robert Haig who was his father. He was an engineer and his mother was Emily Hudson and he had very strict religious parents. They belonged to a religious sector known as the Plymouth Brethren who were purists and they were Protestants. In being purists they didn't really believe in any sort of entertainment other than reading bible stories. Things like sports, participating in sports and stuff like that were like strictly forbidden. They weren't, they just, they weren't allowed to do stuff like that. His father believed that the world was evil and the family needed to separate themselves from the world basically. He, he just wanted them to live in this community and separate themselves from everyone else. In Haig's upbringing his father would heavily reference the Lord and he he told Haig they were being observed by a higher power. His father also told him that he had a blemish on his like on his own head which had come from him sinning in his childhood and he told him that his mother didn't have a mark because she was an angel and he basically informed his son that if he sinned in any way that he would get the same blemish. Haig's youth he became terrified of developing a similar sort of mark because obviously this was like his dad was basically telling him this was like the sign of the devil so he was scared to like do anything any slight misdemeanor in case he would have this mark. It's believed that the turning point in Haig's psyche became when when he lied or committed other questionable behaviors that were obviously classed as sinable behaviors he realized that no mark would appear. I think he then started to question what his dad had told him. It's believed that this sort of made him feel invincible and that basically he could do anything and get away with anything. He actually had a really promising childhood. He was very very good at playing the piano and he loved classical music he had a real interest in classical music he won multiple scholarships um to schools obviously shows how promising his childhood was he won scholarships to both queen elizabeth grammar school and also to wakefield cathedral he chose the wakefield cathedral route and became a choir boy Haig himself later went on to reveal how lonely his childhood was. He claimed that he didn't have any friends and that the only friends that he really had were his neighbour's dog and his own pets which is, is quite sad really. His dad also erected a massive fence around the outside of the house to sort of keep out prying eyes. He wanted to keep the world out and not allow that to look in because obviously he seen the world as evil and sinful. This obviously socially isolated Haig from everyone else outside of their household. So also in his childhood he later went on to claim that he had these horrific religious nightmares included trees, crucifixes, weeping blood. So he left school age 16 to become a motor apprentice and um, he was 
becoming like an engineer's apprentice and then after a year he decided that, that wasn't for him and then he left that job to go into insurance from what he sort of said about him i think he was one of those people and, and it sort of becomes clear later on with his crimes that he wanted to earn a hell of a lot of money but not do a lot of work and i think the whole motor inside of things was just too messy for him and it was a hell of a lot of work for not a lot of money in his opinion when working within insurance and advertising at the age of 21 he was fired because it was believed that he had stole from the cash box in 1934 he stopped attending church and he met a girl called Betty Hammer and she was aged 21. The couple I think hit it off at first and they quickly married. They'd literally known each other a couple of months and then they got married. Later the same year he was then arrested for fraud. While he was in jail for fraud Betty actually gave birth to a little girl. She was pregnant and she gave birth to a little girl who she put up for adoption. I don't think he ever, ever had anything to do with his daughter. There's never, ever any mention of it. I believe she just got put up for adoption. I don't even know if he was aware he had a daughter. I assume he was, but there's not a lot said apart from the fact that she was pregnant and she put the baby up for adoption. She decided to leave him. And from that point on, his family ostr ostracised him. So they basically disowned him and had very little to do with him. I don't think they had anything to do with him anyway from this point onwards. You know, they were, like I say, heavily religious and fraud, theft, all of that is cynical. This is quite a long backstory leading up to him committing murders. He has a long criminal history of being in and out of jail. I am going to explain what he was in and out of jail for but a lot of it was fraud. Like I said I think he was just trying to make a quick book but not do a lot of work for it if that makes sense so he was literally released from jail and on his release from jail he was then jailed again for 15 months for fraud involving cars god this guy he was then freed um, and he tried to go straight so he decided you know what let's not be in and out of jail let's go straight and he set up a dry cleaning business with a partner and his partner was then accidentally killed in a motorbike accident I mean, you couldn't write this stuff. So in 1936, he decided he was going to move to London and he actually became a chauffeur for William McSwan, who was from a really wealthy family. I don't think at this moment in time he realised that the McSwans were as wealthy as what they were. They owned an amusement park. He also helped them um, maintain the machines at the amusement park. He owned the amusement park with his parents, Donald and Amy McSwan. William seemed to really like Haig and he was actually disappointed when Haig decided he was going to leave and move on to other ventures. So he then set up another business. He then decided to set up another of his own businesses and this time he decided he was going to become a bogus solicitor and as you can imagine this went down really well for the guy you know like it had done every other time in the past it landed him in jail again so he then ended up in jail for four years he was released and then he was jailed again for theft <laughs> So this guy is like in and out of prison for a significant amount of time. Upon his arrest for theft, um, he, he come to this thought process that him leaving his victims alive was the issue and that the reason he was in and out of jail all the time was because he was leaving his victims alive to report the crimes, where if there was no victim, then the crime would never get reported, was his thought process. Haig then became intrigued by the crimes of a French murderer called George Alexandre Sarah. He disposed of his victims using sulfuric acid to get rid of their bodies. Then Haig went on to experiment while he was in the prison's tin shop using field mice and he soon figured out that the field mice's bodies disappeared within 30 minutes of him putting them into acid. Not sure how he got away with testing out his theory on these mice in the prison tin shop. I have no idea. he came come up with this idea that he wanted to get rich quick and he was thinking up a way to prey on rich older women and he believed in this no corpse, no conviction. Obviously if there was no body then there was no one to, con there was no way to convict him of the crime. He was freed in 1943 and he became an accountant with an engineering firm. Hig in 
1944 was then involved in a car accident and the car accident was quite nasty. Haig suffered a head wound which resulted in a bleed, it like bled into his mouth and he later went on to blame this event as the catalyst that reawakened his blood filled nightmares so he blamed this car accident on reawakening the nightmares that he'd suggested he'd had as a child and that's why he went on to commit all these awful acts of murder shortly after all of that he rented a basement space at 79 gloucester road where he set up his workshop which was basically a grim death trap to lure his unsuspecting victims so soon after setting up this death trap by chance he actually bumped into his previous employer William McSwan and they decided they were going to go for a drink to have a catch up so they decided to go for a drink in the goat pub of Kensington. McSwan introduced Haig to his parents Amy and Donald McSwan and he explained that he helped his parents by collecting rent on their properties. Haig was really interested in this and it he was very jealous and envious of the lifestyle that they led. He wanted that lifestyle for himself. So on the 6th of September 1944, McSwan disappeared. He went missing. Haig had lured him down to the basement in Gloucester Road and he murdered him. He hit him over the back of the head and beat him to death. He then placed McSwan's body into a vat, um, like a big gallon drum um, of sulfuric acid. He tipped sulfuric acid into this drum to dissolve the body. Two days later, the body had turned to sludge and he disposed of the sludge. He poured it down a manhole. I think there was like a drainage system in the place that he was renting out, like this basement. So he just poured it down the manhole in this basement. When McSwan disappeared. He was from a wealthy family. You know, Amy and Donald, his parents, began to question where he was and like what had happened to him. Haig, being the manipulative man that he was, told William's parents that he had um, gone into hiding in Scotland because he didn't want to be drafted to the war. He didn't, he, like, he was trying to avoid being called up for military service. So then Haig moved into William's property and began collecting the rent for the other properties that William obviously would normally do for um, William's parents but he wanted the money for himself he didn't want to be collecting the money to give to McSwan's parents he wanted more he wanted what they had so he did this for it must have been you know like a few months and then the McSwans started to become you know worried and suspicious as to why their the war was coming to an end but the son didn't seem to be returning home and on the 2nd of July 1945 he lured Donald and Amy McSwan William's parents to Gloucester Road by basically telling them that their son had returned home and it was for like a surprise visit and like he was going to be like really happy to see them and he then murdered them in the basement and disposed of their bodies. He blunt floss trauma, basically give them blows to the head and then disposed of their bodies in um, the vat drums again with sulfuric acid and then tipped it down the drain. Haig went on to live off their estate. Some people say their estate was worth £4,000. Some people say it was worth £8,000. Some people say it was worth £6,000. So there's not really a clear figure of what their estate was actually worth, but it was worth upwards in our time of like over £200,000 because obviously you've got to equate for inflation and he lived off their estate for like the next two years. I just like wonder how he got away with it because this family if they were so prevalent they clearly had a bit of money. How did no one look for them? That's what confuses me that no one looked for them. So Haig basically took control of their assets. He began to claim for William's pension checks and um, he sold all of the family's property and then he moved into the Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington. By summer of 1947, Haig had become addicted to gambling. Obviously, because of this, he needed more cash. By 1947, he had plans to move on to his next victim. To solve his financial problems, he decided to move on to another couple, to Rob and Kill. Obviously, you know, 
he wanted this flash lifestyle but like i say he didn't want to work for it so he moved on to dr archibald henderson and his wife rose he basically wiggled his way into their lives by pretending he wanted to purchase a property they were selling he faked his interest in um a property that they were selling and obviously they got the couple got talking to him and he got invited to the henderson's flat to play piano for their housewarming party obviously you know we're aware of the fact that in his childhood he was a really good piano player so he must have worked his way wormed his way in and told the hendersons this and that's how he got access to their flat while at this housewarming party he obviously decided to take a little snoop around the the archibald residence and he actually stole the husband's revolver he stole archibald henderson's revolver and he planned to use it in his next crime he decided it was time to sort of rent himself a new workshop he rented himself a new workshop um, to leopold road crowley essex and he returned to gloucester road and moved all of the acid and drums and everything from gloucester road to crowley road so after he'd obviously finished moving everything across to the new warehouse or whatever you want to call it on the 12th of february 1948 he drove mr henderson to crowley on the pretense that he was showing him an adventure and obviously you know this guy ha was working as a as an engineer so and he was such a compulsive manipulative liar and person that he had obviously manipulating Mr. Henderson into believing he's invented this amazing thing that he just needs to see. And he shot him in the back of the head with the revolver he had stolen from the Henderson's property. He then lured his wife, Mrs. Henderson, to the workshop claiming that her husband had fell ill while um he had obviously gone to see this invention and then he shot her as well he then disposed of their bodies in oil drums and then he forged a letter to get control of their estate he sold off all of their possessions except a dog and their car which he kept after this Haig moved on to his next and final victim who was 69 year old olive durand deacon she like haig was also living on the in the onslow court hotel in kensington she was a wealthy widow whose husband was a solicitor and he was called john durand deacon haig invited olive to leopold road on the 18th of February 1949 and there's a couple of different reasons as to how he lured her to do Leopold Road it's quite difficult to actually pinpoint which reason it was so some sources state that he managed to lure her there due to she had come up with this way of creating artificial fingernails and obviously Haig was an engineer so he was like oh yeah I can engineer that that's a great idea I can get behind the other idea was that he had come up with this idea and suggested to her that he wanted to open up and run a cosmetics factory so obviously it perked her interest and but either either or he lured her to Leopold Road. He then shot her in the neck with the 38 caliber Weebly revolver which he had stolen from the Henderson's property. He stripped her of all of her valuables including a Persian lamb coat and then put her body in acid to dissolve. I don't really I'm not sure what his thought process was with her but he didn't actually gain an awful lot from her murder it was literally basically the belongings that he ha she had on her which was some jewellery the Persian court I don't know whether he'd got sloppy greedy and was just after anything he could get maybe um you know if he still had this gambling addiction maybe he just needed to feed the addiction I'm not really sure so two days after Olive's disappearance her friend Constance Lane who also lived in the hotel she began to become a little bit suspicious and she was also just genuinely worried for her friend like she was a retired lady who was living at the hotel whose friend had just disappeared and obviously you know because Olive was living at the hotel too and hadn't returned home she was suspicious that something had happened to her so she started to ask Haig lots and lots of questions you know like have you seen her where is she and then she asked him a question that completely caught him off guard and she turned around and she said 
quote, don't you know where she is? She told me you were taking her down to the factory, end quote. Shit, he could be in trouble here. He panicked and he thought, right, what can I do to avoid any suspicion? He went to the police station with Constance. He thought in doing that, he was gonna, you know, take suspicion away from himself because, you know, a guilty man's not going to walk into a police station and report a person missing that he's just murdered, I think was his thought process. When he was at the Chelsea police station, a officer actually recognised him and then he ran a background check on him. That background check must have turned up some suspicious things, which it will have done because, you know, he was known for fraud and everything else. That must have jumped out on the computer when they were doing this background check. I mean, his whole life he's been in and out of prison. That's probably come up. So they then decide to investigate this guy and they bring him in for questioning. And while they were questioning him, they searched his hotel room and they searched the workshop on Leopold Road. They found this Atachi case. Now an Atachi case is basically like a small briefcase and inside this briefcase was a dry cleaning receipt for the Mrs. Duran Decon, so Olive's coat, you know that Persian lamb coat. So they also found papers referring to the Hendersons and the McSwans and a diary and in the diary he had kept abbreviated details of the murders. Oh my god you've got it there in black and white on paper. And then further investigation, they'd gone round the back of the workshop and they'd found there was like this pile of sludge on some brick out the back of the workshop and upon further investigation a pathologist called Keith Simpson revealed that there was Mrs Duran so there was Olive's handbag there was 28 pounds of human fat corroded human bones three human gallstones and part of a denture which was la later identified as Olive's during the trial by her dentist there goes the nobody no crime thing out the window because there's still evidence so despite the evidence Haig still thought he was invincible so Haig was of the opinion nothing could be found from his human slaughterhouse and cock cockily recounted in great detail the escapades of the deaths of the people he had murdered. Um, as far as he was concerned, it was a case of corpus delicti. No bodies, no crime, no punishment. So he was still convinced that because there was no bodies that they couldn't prove that the crime had took place, but there was forensic evidence. So Haig was then arrested on the 26th of February 1945, and when they put the evidence to him, he said, quote, Mrs. Duran Deacon no longer exists. I have destroyed her with acid. You cannot prove murder without a body. He then went on to admit we killed eight other people, but they could only ever substantiate five of the murders. He said that he'd also killed a young man named Matt a girl from Eastbourne and a woman from Hammersmith. Police later believe that he confessed to those murders just to help with an insanity plea. I think when he eventually realised that he wasn't getting away with this, he tried to plead insanity. So then in this interrogation, he was questioned by Detective Inspector Albert Webb and he, Haig said to him, like, tell me frankly, what are the chances of being released from Broadmoor? The inspector said he could not discuss that sort of thing. So Haig replied by saying, well, if I told you the truth, you would not believe me. It sounds too fantastic to believe. Thursday, the... So after his arrest, Haig remained in custody in cell two of the Horsham Police Station in Barlot Road. He was charged with murder and had his first appearance before the magistrates at the nearby courthouse and then later on a full trial was held. Haig pleaded insanity. He claimed that he had drunk the blood of his victim so he confessed to having dreams dominated by blood as a young boy. Then he said that when he was involved in his car accident that the dreams returned to him. I, and it's, he said, I quote, I saw before me a forest of crucifixes which gradually turned into trees. First there appeared to be dew or rain dripping from the branches but as I approached I realised it was blood. The whole forest began to writhe and the trees dark and erect to ooze blood. A man went from each tree 
catching the blood. When the cup was full, he approached me and said, drink, and I was unable to move. Some papers labelled him as the vampire, um, and he got the, the label of vampire because of this blood-filled dream. And he was put on trial on Monday, the 18th of August, 1949. The News of the World newspaper actually made a deal with him because he had no money. They would pay for his counsel for his defence if he would give them an exclusive story. The Daily Mirror was then found in contempt of court for explicitly portraying Haig as a vampire. Obviously this vampire thing was all to aid his plea of insanity. I don't think it went down very well when the newspapers started portraying him like a vampire. The Attorney General led the prosecution and he urged the jury to reject Haig's plea of insanity because he had literally acted with malice and afterthought. So this was all part of him being such a good manipulator that he thought well if I do this because obviously he'd already asked, I already asked the police like what's the chances of me getting out he's obviously thought if I act insane and claim it was all insanity then I might get away with it or I'll just end up in you know they end up in a mental institution rather than going to prison so I think that was, was the thought process. So then it become clear to the jury and the judge and everyone in court that Haig had used acid to destroy the victim's bodies because he'd misunderstood the meaning of corpus delecti and mistakenly believed that if the bodies could not be found a murder conviction would not be possible which is just not not true. Despite the absence of victims' bodies there was sufficient forensic evidence to for him to be convicted of the murders and be subse subsequently executed. The jury retired on the second day and it took them 17 minutes to find him perfectly sane. When he was sentenced to death, it was announced that there would be no appeal. So basically the ruling had been made and that ruling was final. It's reported that Haig, when he was actually in his prison cell, he asked one of the prison guards if they could have a um, practice run of his hanging so it could run smoothly which is just absolutely bizarre but then on Wednesday the 10th of August a crowd gathered and there was a crowd and they gathered outside Wandsworth prison in bright sunshine at 9am Haig was hanged. Just prior to his execution Haig was actually asked if he wanted a brandy um, to which he responded make it a large one old boy. Haig then was led to the gallows and was hanged hanged. I'm just going to go through a few little afterthoughts. Haig finished his life story for the newspaper that had paid for his trial and he wrote letters to his parents who did not see him before he died so his father didn't see him didn't have anything to do with him his mother did send him greetings through a reporter he also told reporters that he believed that he um, would be back and he believed in re reincarnation and that he would be back to complete his mission madame tussauds actually approached him for a fitting of a depth death mask and he was more than happy to oblige so just to quickly follow up the claim the vampire claims they could never collaborate whether he had consumed the blood before dissolving them in acid a lot of critics believe that he was a cold-hearted killer who arrogantly believed that there, if there was no body there was no crime to pin on him. He was known to be a manipulative and compulsive liar and he was prone to saying anything to get himself off um, and out of compromising positions and most psychiatrists agreed that although Haig suffered from mental health he was not insane and he was perfectly aware of his murderous actions that involved m meticulous planning. He had tried to impress psychiatrists with more like with in-depth details of the dreams um, and his obsession with blood drinking and all of this sort of stuff but none of his efforts obviously betrayed him as a lunatic he, he you know it never worked in his favor but then they found out that years before he'd actually developed a friendship with an employee of the Sussex Psychiatric Hospital and he'd shown a great deal of interest in mental illness so he had a talent of deception so guys this is the final look and I'm back with my thoughts and feelings I truly believe he was fully aware of what he was doing and he his motive was to get rich quick he just wanted um, a quick way to earn money but not do a lot of work anyway guys you know i feel a bit weird about how to end these videos but i'm just gonna say i will see you in the next one thanks so much for watching